Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past. We'll delve into the folklore of the times and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So saddle up or settle in for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is season one, episode one. The Drift and Ramble podcast is sponsored by Hypervape, hypervape hypervape.com. Like the chrysalis that becomes a moth or the mighty oak that springs from a single acorn, we all hope to one day achieve something bigger than ourselves, to reach some level of notoriety, success, or wealth. The stuff that legends are made of. What I'm about to tell you is a story about that change from pupa into moth. It's a story about redemption, struggle, and triumph over adversity. A story about what happens when the paths of desire and reality never meet. A poor career choice that leads to infamy, and infamy for deeds that no one would ever seek. Because fame is fickle and fate is cruel, today's episode is all about the life and death of Elmer McCurdy. At 11 p.m. on March 23, 1911, near Lenapaw, Oklahoma, four desperados were waiting anxiously in the brisk night air for the evening train to arrive. A distant steam whistle blows, signifying the train's departure from the Lenapaw station, and the men fidget and shuffle nervously about. Checking their pistols, loading their rifles, and saying little, their heads full of hopes and ideas, dreams of easy money. These men are all well steeped in the tradition and mystique of train robbery. Newspaper headlines have held little else of interest for some 50 years now, longer than any of these men have lived thus far. Iconic outlaws and frontier badmen loomed large in the press, and they no doubt held a certain allure and mystique for some regardless of how inaccurate the reporting was. And while this particular group of Greenhorn outlaws were perhaps a little late to the game, they offered nothing new to the train robber mythos. One of them did possess a special skill, however, a skill that could prove to be useful on the lawless fast track to wealth. He had been trained in the use of the deadly explosive nitroglycerin. His name is Elmer McCurdy. Standing next to Elmer is Albert Connor, and across the tracks are brothers Walter and Lee Jarrett. The boys are all dreaming of a big payday of ill-gotten gains, dependent on Elmer's self-proclaimed expertise with explosives to blow the safe and reap its rewards. Walter Jarrett had only just met Elmer a few weeks before, in jail. Though now fast friends, He couldn't have known much about Elmer's skills except by what Elmer may have told him. Walter Jarrett and his brother Lee, already seasoned criminals, had hoped to hit the big time with the help of their new outlaw friend. When the train had made sufficient distance from the station, Elmer and his crew went to work. The overnight mail clerk, H.P. Pinckney, would later recount that he dove to the floor of the express car as a hail of bullets pierced the walls and ricocheted off the imposing iron safe. He lay on the floor of the rail car as the train began to slow. Just a few miles north of Lenapaw, in the desolate open space of the Oklahoma prairies, the night train was making an unscheduled stop. 250 souls on board, some dressed in night clothes, woke hastily to the sound of a man running car to car, yelling, Wake up! The train is being robbed! Once inside, the Jarrett boys, now masked, 
retained control of the express car and watched curiously while Elmer went to work. McCurdy learned to ply his trade, a secondary vocation, while serving in the U.S. military. Here, he was trained to blow up mountains and clear roadways, using the most volatile of all known combustibles, nitroglycerin. It was the very substance from which dynamite was made. A match, a fuse, a quick and hurried scramble off the train to count down the explosion. One one thousand, two one thousand. Trouble was, though, that Elmer's training may not have been complete, or perhaps he just wasn't a very good student. Either way, his clumsy attempt at safe-cracking was foiled by his own miscalculation of how much explosive to use. In this case, he used just a little too much. Maybe it was simply a case of all things in moderation. Elmer's stint with the Army didn't last too long. He was discharged due to alcoholism. His ability to hold a job seemed secondary to the ability to hold a bottle, something Walter Jarrett couldn't possibly have known. The boys, now deafened and confused by the blast, drew guns to assuage any interference from passengers on the train. Albert Connor worked the left and right sides of the train from the outside with covering fire from his Winchester rifle, a tactic he employed so effectively as to confuse the passengers and witnesses into thinking there were far more bandits outside than just one. Elmer himself tried to assess the damage while his disorientation subsided. His hearing probably mutated from a complete silence to a dull ring that made normal conversation almost impossible. But upon inspection, the blast had proven useless against the safe's heavy cast-iron door. Elmer began to set a second charge. Pinckney, the mail clerk, later recounted that he, his assistant, the engineer, the fireman, and the baggage man from the train were gathered up, loaded in the blast-damaged rail car, and then offloaded again when the charges were set. The first and second time this happened may have seemed frightening, but by the fourth time, the whole affair may have seemed comical or frustrating. What did the passengers think? The train was held up for hours as the men plied their trade. They tried desperately to liberate some form of wealth from that safe. The first, second, and third blasts were all nitroglycerin. Each blast did little noticeable damage to the safe. With the fourth charge, however, Elmer switched from using nitroglycerin to sticks of dynamite. The resulting blast was just as deafening. The Jarrett boys were probably shouting words of encouragement, like, You gold darn fool, Elmer! Hurry up! Debris and twisted metal still descended from the Oklahoma evening sky. The door to the safe had been finally freed from its hinges. It rested in the hole it tore through the opposite side of the rail car. Inside the safe was supposed to be $4,000 in silver coins, but due to Elmer's overuse of explosives, that silver was transformed into liquid by the heat and sprayed across the express car like hot liquid lava. It quickly cooled and hardened into a strange silver stain in the cold night air. For a first-time train robber, Elmer wasn't easily discouraged. He demanded mail clerk Pinckney's pocket watch before turning his attention back to the silver stain. If four explosions weren't enough, he grabbed a pickaxe and began to chip away at the pile of silver coins still fused to the safe's frame. Elmer's accomplices began to sift through the wreckage and pick up loose and twisted silver coins strewn throughout the rail car. Meanwhile, Elmer himself tried in vain to remove at least a portion of the silver stain from the corner of the blast-damaged car. Apparently, that failed too, though, because when the now-beleaguered and battle-worn Iron Mountain-Missouri-Pacific train 
rolled into its final destination, the silver stain was still intact. The total loot these greenhorn outlaws made off with was a mere four hundred and fifty dollars. So began the short and clumsy criminal career of Elmer McCurdy. The men did make their getaway, but the Iron Mountain train debacle was enough for Walter Jarrett. He soon dissolved his partnership with McCurdy after a brief knife fight that left both men scarred and bloodied. Jarrett headed back to Oklahoma, while McCurdy headed for the Osage Hills and changed his name, calling himself a number of aliases in the hopes of blurring any recognition. In the months and crimes that lay ahead, things never really improved. The would-be bandit proved terrible at his chosen vocation. Undaunted, Elmer continued to ply his trade, and his miscalculations proved almost comical. He would one day be known as the bandit who wouldn't give up. Whether it was a case of drunken determination or pig-headed desperation, we may never know, but his next attempt at thievery would prove equally unprofitable. When Elmer, now calling himself Frank Curtis, and his new accomplice, Amos Hayes, a man he met on the job with a construction company near Chautauqua, Kansas, Hayes told him of his plan to rob the Citizens Bank in Chautauqua. Elmer didn't ask a lot of questions. Amos had an axe to grind, because the bank wouldn't loan him any money, even if, as he told Elmer, they had plenty of money. The co-conspirators quickly found a third man named Elijah Higgins, and with a thirst for easy money, they all three set out to liberate the bank's vault's contents through Elmer's expertise. It was late in the evening on September 21, 1911, when Elmer and his crew began their stroll up the alley towards the bank. The sleepy townsfolk had no idea what was coming the three fast friends felt certain of their victory. After spending a mere two hours' time tediously chipping away at the brick exterior wall of the bank with pickaxes and crowbars, Elmer and Amos went to work, setting a long fuse on his nitroglycerin charge, while lookout Higgins kept an eye out for lawmen. The fuse ran out back through the fresh new hole in the wall and led back to the alley, where the men waited for the safe to blow. Not wanting a repeat of the last fiasco, Elmer had taken precautions with this charge, increasing it two or three times over what he'd used on the train's safe. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. The force of the blast was terrific. The entire building shook, as did the earth beneath it. According to the Seddon Times Star, a regional newspaper, it blew the outer door off the safe and threw it with terrific force against the front door of the vault. That vault door, with its iron frame, was blown out of place and across the room to the plate glass window. It plowed its way through the furniture leaving everything in its path a complete wreck. Amos and Elmer ran back into the safe, but quickly realized the inner door was still intact. Elmer began to set up a second charge, but before he could blow it, lookout man Higgins ran in and said lights were coming on all over town. McCurdy and his boys grabbed $150 in gold and silver coins from a tray that sat on top of the safe and fled town on horseback. Just 50 bucks per man on a three-way split. The bank vault and building were nearly destroyed, but the safe and its contents remained intact. Higgins may have got cold feet 
and smartly decided to forego further escapades with the other two freshly minted outlaws, or perhaps he reprised his role as lookout. But Amos and Elmer were undaunted. In fact, they set their sights even higher. Amos told Elmer about a $400,000 cargo bound for the Osage Indian nation, and the two boys devised a plan to relieve the Katy train of its not-so-secret payload. In less than a year, Elmer was working on his third big heist. Never mind that the first two attempts went so horribly wrong. Elmer may have thought that three's the charm. For all his criminal conduct, McCurdy wasn't a well man. At the time of his fateful, final train robbery, he suffered from pneumonia, tuberculosis, trichinosis, bunions, and alcoholism. He looked pale and far older than his years. It was no small feat that he could even keep up with his criminal cohorts, or maybe it was a case of them keeping pace with Elmer. Though his next job held the promise of redemption for Mr. McCurdy, fate may have also had a hand. A $400,000 payday may have rocketed the McCurdy name to legendary status. The boys could be set for life, and after all, it was only one night's work. At 1 a.m., October 4, 1911, three bandits flagged down the number 29 southbound train and made their way to the car where the safe was kept. What happened next isn't exactly certain, but what is known for sure is that the men didn't blow the safe. They didn't have to, because the money wasn't there. The three buffoons had confused the train schedules and managed to rob the wrong train. They tried to make the best of their situation. They shook down the auditor, the conductor, and the mail clerk. They turned over every seat cushion looking for hidden loot, save for the one where the auditor had hidden $250. They also missed the conductor's wallet, which he discreetly slipped into a cuspidor that the robbers overlooked. The boys did find several kegs of beer, one of which they broke open and spent considerable time drinking from, and they found two demijohns of high-grade whiskey. Among the beer, the booze, and a whopping $46 in cash, the boys also relieved the mail clerk of his watch the auditor of his pistol, and the conductor of his coat. They arranged the whiskey on their horses and made off with the goods, while the conductor walked the two miles back to the town of Okessa to report the crime. A lackluster end to their glorious plans. In fact, one newspaper the Bartlesville Enterprise, reported the crime as one of the smallest in the history of train robbery. While the crime itself was unsuccessful, the law doesn't differentiate between a successful and a failed robbery. As such, a posse was formed of some 50 men, and they pursued the bumbling bandits as they made their getaway. While news accounts vary widely, one thing is certain. Elmer McCurdy was shot and killed after an hour-long standoff with some of the men from this posse. After tracking McCurdy and finding evidence of his hideaway in the form of empty whiskey bottles, McCurdy either vowed through vocalization or deed that he wasn't giving up without some kind of fight, and his pursuers did not disappoint him. He died from a single gunshot wound to the chest. And although this tiny perforation may seem like the final punctuation mark on Elmer's story, in fact, it is not. You see, this is the point where Elmer's story really begins. After all, Elmer McCurdy did finally achieve some form of notoriety. 
he became one of the most well-known dead outlaws of all time. Or perhaps he became famous just for being dead. Elmer didn't start out as a bad guy. He just kind of got knocked around a bit by life's unpredictable journey. He never knew his father. When he finally learned his aunt was actually his mother, he must have felt a high degree of confusion. And just a few short years later, he lost both his mother and his grandfather within weeks of each other. Under the direction of his grandfather, Elmer had been a plumber's apprentice, and by all accounts, he seemed to be good at it. But when the economy soured and jobs became scarce, Elmer found himself unemployed, and it wasn't long before he became well acquainted with the bottle. Alone, adrift, and unemployed, Elmer set out to find his fortune. He began to drift and ramble up and down the eastern seaboard, until one day he heard the calling to find his fortune out west. Ending up in Oklahoma, it was here where he tried a short stint in the military and got his training with nitroglycerin. As luck would have it, Elmer proved to be mostly ineffective with explosives. In fact, it's amazing he hadn't blown himself up. Many a mining accident was said to be blamed on the unpredictable nature of nitroglycerin. To think that Elmer's mishaps did not result in blowing himself right off the map was a feat of fortune in its own right. But Elmer, diseased and desperate as he was, died as most outlaws do, cornered and fighting for another chance to run. Elmer had a $2,000 reward for his arrest, but the stipulation was he must be turned in alive to collect it. Even still, the lawmen delivering Elmer's body to the mortician made their case to Congress in the hopes of retrieving the reward. After all, they had exchanged gunfire with the man. It seemed that dead, McCurdy had no value to anyone. Still, everyone seemed to have their hand out. With no kinfolk to claim him, his body was delivered to the Johnson Funeral Home in Pahuska, Oklahoma, and things began to get weird. The fugitive was photographed in morbid repose and outfitted in his pine box, which was not all that unusual at the time. But mortician Joseph L. Johnson performed an autopsy and made the fateful decision to embalm Elmer McCurdy with a crude Civil War-era arsenic-based embalming procedure, the very same one used on Abraham Lincoln to preserve his body. Could it be that Johnson was planning from the start to send Elmer on his epic journey toward celebrity? The practice wasn't widely used, but wasn't unknown either. What could Johnson have been thinking to preserve the bandit in this way? In Episode 2, we'll learn about the long, strange trip that Elmer McCurdy took to reach his grave. It's bound to be a journey you'll remember. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West.